Aloha to my innerverse tribe and welcome to the one within all. Here we are in this eternally new yet incomprehensibly ancient point we call the present moment. Although we all may get lost sometimes in contemplating the infinite realms of past, present, and future, some exceptional beings out there are able to not only witness the sublime aspects of nature and cosmos, but transmit the truth of these trips into symbolically charged creations of incredible complexity and depth. The value of these expressions from the higher overself of humanity can be as subjectively infinite as the primordial unconscious itself, and in viewing mystical masterpieces of visionary vivaciousness, even the least esoterically interested individual can find themselves in spontaneous egoic remission, temporarily rising up to heights of consciousness previously unknown, thanks to the mystical bridge that the artist creates through their imagination. Our guest today is Hakan Hasim, a supremely skilled digital artist hailing from Turkey and one who has certainly grasped some of the metaphysical underpinnings of our reality and manifested magical bodies for these universal archetypes through his artwork. From cosmic transmissions of pan-dimensional manuscripts to meticulous mandalas of synchromystical meaning, Hakan is a wondrous weaver of epic narratives in imagery. His work is a shining example of how the awareness of source consciousness in artwork can transcendentally mend the gaps of knowledge, syntax, and linguistics between the creator and the viewer. And I'm extraordinarily excited to have Hakan here today to do his psychedelic thing in conversational form. So it's time to buckle up those seatbelts, smoke it if you've got it, and prepare thine self for blast off into the trip to mean worlds that our galactic guru of the day is so graciously about to guide us through. Dear friends, please lend me your energy as we project our gratitude and good intentions towards Hakan Hasim for the purpose of uplifting the infinite self that we all embody. Together, let's take a moment and feel or imagine that inner light shining in appreciation towards the indivisible spirit of our special guest, and if you've got a moment, you should spend it on checking out the show notes for links to HakanHasim.net and his social media profiles, where you can feast your soul's astral eyeballs on some of the tastiest digi mystical images on the internet. Thanks for coming on the show, my friend, and big welcome to you, my brother. Uh, thank you, Chance. Thank you for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to be on the show. It is an honor to speak with individuals like yourself who have put so much time into putting positive and uh, imaginative information into their daily creations and not many of us do reach the level of expression that you're attaining so i love to have people like yourself on to talk a little bit and pick your brain and can i have a little bit of your backstory tell me a little bit about yourself where you're from and what got you into creating i grew up in australia actually in sydney and a small bit in germany i don't remember too much of that though uh, i was in germany to three or four years old and then we moved to Australia and I spent most of my like younger childhood in Sydney. My father passed away, he was in, in Australia when I was around 10 years old and after that my mother decided to like uh, move us back to Turkey where we had larger family over here. So it was like quite a while ago in 1993 we moved back here to Turkey and I've been coming and going since I, I went went back and studied art in, in Sydney, beginning at like 1999 or 2000, and then decided to move back to Turkey. So I've been more or less based in Turkey for the last 20 years, 18, 20 years or something. That's very cool. So you say you studied art, and yeah. what, what did that entail? Well, I went to art school in, in Sydney. Uh, I studied uh, painting more or less traditional media, painting with oils and acrylics, and just some photography and sculpture. I wasn't too satisfied. It was I, I, I did learn quite a bit of technique, but I felt that the, the whole that uh, school academic atmosphere stifled my creativity a bit. And after I, I finished school, I wanted to. I was really interested in cinema and, and animation. And I was just on the side, just playing around with Photoshop and, and other visual software, like turn of the century. I, after that, I decided to study, uh, I went to uh, like a two-year film and animation school as well. I went to that in Turkey when I moved back to Turkey. Uh, so I did some classical education, but wasn't really, I didn't learn a whole lot from it, just the basic fundamentals 
but all the learning digital software and learning how to just navigate all the different programs. I did that all by myself and they got off the help of tutorials and stuff like that. Yeah, I find that that's the same story for many people who become more interested in the digital mediums is they teach themselves these programs. A lot of them have so much depth in the user interface that you can kind of figure out your own way to do whatever it is that you want to do. And there's more than one way to approach things. And I love that about Photoshop and other programs like it. I do think that it is a good thing to balance out some of the classical education with having more freedom to explore. The problem being with the classical education is that expectations about how things should look or should be done get placed on people. But the upside to me, I also studied film in school. And to me, that was extremely useful because getting a handle on the language that is inherent to our unconscious minds in symbolic form through images and especially through motion pictures, there is an entire language there of how lighting works and angles of the camera and inform us about the meaning of what we're seeing, even when we haven't even had the classical training of knowing what little aspect means what. But once you get that classical training and can sort of analyze and deconstruct the imagery from seeing that you're seeing from other people, it also helps you construct your imagery in a way that has impact that matches your intention. Yeah, yeah, cool. I, I agree. When you were talking, I was just thinking back and I think I, I did learn uh, a whole lot more from at school at school cinema than I did at like classical art school. Like you said, the language and the, the way films are formed, like the, the whole semiology, like the symbolism and the way the camera cameras are used. It's quite fun and interesting to learn. I don't think I... I might not have been able to stumble on that information if I was just dabbling on my own. Yeah, some people do kind of probably figure it out instinctually to a degree. And yeah. just like teaching yourself to play an instrument. But yeah, it does really it does really help to know what the sort of rules are because then you have a better idea of when you're following the rules, when you're gonna break the rules, how that's gonna how you're gonna bend the two. But with uh, your artwork, there's more than just the language of film going on. I also see a lot of interesting metaphysical symbolism through your work that uh, speaks to a, no a personal knowledge of some esoteric information and maybe a personal study of that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've spent most of my life at times deeply immersed and sometimes, I um, mean, yeah, just most of my life studying esoteric information and non-ordinary states. And I haven't had a very you know, like a strict religious background. It's just shifted a lot. I've been doing a lot of research when I was younger. I was exposed to my parents, for, like uh, my father, deeply studying the Kabbalah and. It's a tradition in our family, and sometime when we were living in Australia, my mother decided to check out Jehovah's Witnesses, and we were, for several years I was deeply immersed in studying, like, studying the, the Bible and the way they would like, approach different ideas and things in the Bible and other concepts, uh, as opposed to more Jewish Kabbalistic traditions. I had a background in that since childhood. That was sort of my entertainment when I was really young. I would just pick up these different religious books and just read through them. And, and there would be these really wild and interesting stories. And that really captured my imagination. And that sort of went on from there. So you've had continued exploration since then. And Kabbalism is actually a very interesting place to start as a child because like here in the West, that is not something that is typically accessible to a young person at any point. It's actually pretty uncommon to study Kabbalah. And so when you do have a knowledge of that, you can actually see how other systems of thought reflect a similar octave or tonal type of pattern that is in Kabbalah, it's in tarot, it's in astro theology, and in the zodiac itself. Having a good understanding of any one of those things, but especially Kabbalah, can definitely help you understand correspondences and how 
correspondences are at play throughout the entire fractal that we call reality. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I was really surprised and excited as I grew older, and especially when I got uh, access to the internet and uh, more information on the different cultures that I didn't really know about back then. And there was all these, these nexus points where all these different cultures and belief systems and, and ideologies and stuff that would sort of meet and overlap in some points where I started to see there was a, a story being told that's the same story among like all the cultures of the world. I mean, especially studying the, the, the ancient Kemet news and the, the Hindu cultures. Yeah, when I was younger, I didn't really have too much access to that information. But then I found like this, a whole hoard of knowledge that mirrored the, the Kabbalistic traditions. And then all, all sorts of interesting and fun stuff came out where I could see the actual, actually the, the Kabbalistic traditions were more or less taken from the ancient Egyptian, the Kometan peoples. And I don't know, it was just fascinating to see, to maneuver and, and find like a path back to our ancient ancestors in a day where everything is, everything is just gone, just hazy. And I don't know, it's, it's a lot less defined. I'm sure in the early days of the internet and having the ability to start tapping into that kind of information, those were, I mean, I was a kid back then. So as I recall, those were some of the most like heavily, at least here in the West, like heavily separated feeling times, separate from ancestors, separate from real spiritual fulfillment. And it's like for me, so spiritual fulfillment is actually the quest that you've been describing, just the sort of lifetime curiosity and lifetime of always looking deeply into things that are fascinating and understanding more aspects of the reality and seeing how much more there is that you don't know, the more that you do learn. And it's that to me, that's the, that's spiritual fulfillment, not feeling like I have the answer and now I'm all right or saved or in some sort of Western Christian concept. I, to me, the fulfillment is in the the seeking and the knowing that, your questions can be answered, but you are going to get more questions after you get that answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much so. That's the delicious part of the whole journey. The, it, it never ends. And the whole thing is just this beautiful mystery that's, that's there. It's for us. It's for us to, to unpeel and, and to learn and to, for us to adapt to our, our lives and to learn and grow from it. I don't think it's there to be solved. You know? I don't think it ever will be solved. That's the whole beauty of it. Yeah, I totally agree. And I also think that as artists, people that are spending their life force energy towards creation as much as possible, they can even occasionally pull out some of the archetypes of the collective unconscious, the big mystery that we're talking about, the gigantic infinity that can never quite be surmounted. Whenever an artist does play with archetypes and associate symbolic meanings and create epic narratives, as your website describes some of your work, there's a potential for the archetype itself to be altered or influenced in the collective mind through the transformative power that the artist brings to it in their creation. And that's something that I find really interesting is the way that in creating, we actually transform the infinite itself in a way we are that's our communion with the the higher part of ourself and it responds in in kind and neither thing is static is what's it's fascinating to me neither self lower self or higher self yeah 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 for sure man i get the same feeling creating anything is just absolutely wonderful that feeling even preparing food you create these ripples, these frequencies, and, and this resonance that ripples out and completely it transforms everything around you. It's it's very hard to tell. It's really subtle. It's, it's sometimes I can see reflections or refractions of what I created maybe years ahead later in time or maybe a few moments later. I, it's really palpable, that feeling that what you do does come back to you in, in a way it affects your, your entire reality. 
that's one of the other notions that I like to bring to the table when say somebody around me that's religious is talking about God or the creator of all things as, you know, this sort of higher outside of their self separate being when to me, because those ripples of creation do come back to us in our experience and affect us and change us and teach us. And we learn from our own creations. Would the, this just to me proves the point that I was making earlier, or at least as evidence towards the point that the creative force behind us, the creative aspect and intelligence and imaginative consciousness that underlies the universe so that the artist is tapping into is also changed by the thing that it's creating, which is the reality in the same way that we are changed by what we create. Yeah. Yeah. I have no doubt. So all the way up and down the fractal is uh, it's sort of creation, teaching, creator, creation, creating, and this weird cycle. It's very, it's very interesting. And yeah, I definitely see those type of, that type of energy coming through in, in your artwork. And I, appreciate it a lot. I, I'm really happy to have discovered you when I did. Yeah, thank you, man. I mean, I can't really explain it to, ex real, uh, really eloquently the way you did, but I am really deeply influenced by just the fractal, uh, what, what would you call it, just the way the, the fractal nature of the of universe and reality and everything, just the way everything influences each other symbiotically and I get that feeling when I'm making art and through the years when I look back at the different artworks that I've done, I can see how each one has influenced the other one. Sometimes some of them a lot more and some of them a lot less, but there is a deep symbiosis between these sort of things. Yeah, absolutely. And I like how you also tied in other forms of creation to this same type of process, like preparing food. Another problem that we largely have here in the United States is that people, uh, a lot of people are out of touch with that aspect of life itself, which preparing food is a very rewarding feeling. And it gives you a similar kind of confidence boost as completing a piece of art would give you whether or not you have a certain level of skill, your satisfaction after finishing creating something is always going to be there. You, could, you might be like, okay, I could do better next time, but that is actually even part of the satisfaction as it's an aspect that you're learning about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I like to see creation as one whole massive part of, of what we are as like unlimited beings. We have this capacity to create and that can be art, it can be food, it can be children, um, it can be sound and frequency, it can be sculpture and form, so many things. And it can be anything that's from the most, I mean, mundane thing. That That is a form of creation and that's, that's our gift, I think. And uh, how we choose to use that is our lives effectively turn out in the end, like how we utilize our creation to be able to prepare food in, I don't know, different creative ways and make create it lovingly. It changes every aspect of my life and it does for me anyway. On the subject of food again, are you also noticing that your intake and how healthy what it is that you put into yourself is or isn't has any bearing on the things that come out of you in your creative expression? Oh yeah, you had no doubt, man. For most of my life, I've been a really like big meat eater. I used to consume lots of meat, and I think I was a lot more aggressive back then. Uh, the last two, no, not two years, around three years almost, I've stopped eating meat, and uh, the last couple of years, completely vegan. So I've been really vigilant and, and responsible to for what I place in my body and this after a series of experiments that I, I, I did on myself a few years ago I decided to get a lot more deeper into my daily meditations and, and try to attain just more vivid states of consciousness like I would through psychedelics but just with meditation and breathing and I found out that dropping meat entirely like it it gave me a massive boost 
just in that respect, as in just in that aspect of being able to meditate with a lot more clearer head, and it was a lot more effective. And that was after I I tried that a few times. I decided to stop eating meat and, and animal products, and I think it's been quite fruitful since I have stopped me, uh, eating. I think themes of my artwork have also changed a bit as well. Also less masculine nature and a bit more feminine aspect. But yeah, I've been, it really does affect my daily life, my practices, and I do see it in my artwork at times. I have actually been a vegetarian, sounds like approximately the same amount of time as you and a vegan about the same amount of time as you. So that's an yeah. interesting reflection. It definitely helped heighten my personal levels of sensitivity. And I think that's something that artists are willing to do. And a lot of artists are actually looking to find how to do that, increase their sensitivity. That's why creative people tend to be drawn towards psychedelics. I found when I first switched to the non-meat eating lifestyle, I did a full fast and cleanse using a kit recommended by Seven Bomar of Secret Energy. With, yeah, I know that kid. <laughs> he's a cool really? guy. I don't I know yeah. him personally, but he's been a really helpful teacher for me. And I really enjoyed some a few of the products I've got off of his website, especially though this cleanse. I even found that in the last day of the cleanse, which was five days of no food, just a juice only type of fast. I yeah. had a full fledged out of body experience while conscious, like able wow. to see my body and float around my house. And that, and that was something I never had that much sort of liberation before mentally or, or spiritually from the heavy feeling of being stuck in my body. There's always, there was always some kind of discomfort or some sort of process running to sort of keep my attention there in my body. And I don't want to be ungrounded and floating out of my body all the time. Of course, that's not really a, a risk or an issue, but just definitely found more liberation in my in my life as well whenever i reduce the amount of enslaving and torturing of other beings that i was connected to i can't say that i'm fully disconnected from it because it's not that wouldn't be true especially in the united states just using just using dollar bills is connecting you to some sketchy <laughs> stuff but yeah. but yeah we're on the same page there it sounds like and so you said you know seven bomar uh, what how do you guys know each other no, I've been following his stuff for a while, for a few years now. I just, I would just listen to him and just watch his videos, and I found like a lot of the stuff that um, I was really interested in, and found similarities in my own research and also my personal experiences. The stuff he said and talked about mirrored a lot of what I experienced, and some of it was just really out there and I just loved the way he would explain it and put it into words and I think I just sent him an email uh, and we started chatting like back and forth that way for a while like for a few years now and then I joined his he has this ambassador program and I was in there he's got this tribe things the connection thing set up and I met a lot of awesome people through there and it's not just metaphysics and, and spirituality but we, like we got really deep into cryptocurrencies and just practical ways for self-empowerment i haven't met him in person yet I plan to do that sometime soon but haven't i need to go get down to costa rica yeah costa rica is beautiful i had an opportunity to go last year and i did not Go check out the Secret Energy Compound, but I was at Envision Music Festival, yeah. which mm -hmm. is a great place for artists to be. <laughs> a lot of cool stuff to see there. In general, Costa Rica seems like a cool place, and I do recommend anyone listening go check out SecretEnergy.com because there's a huge wealth of interesting spiritual information on all kinds of topics, and also a community of people there that will talk to you and answer questions or at least have a dialogue with you. It's pretty cool. I'm positive that I've made a few friends off of just that site and meeting them through that site and even meeting them in real life later on that were just in my region. They have like a geolocator tool on the website. So that 
is pretty cool. And I think the connecting of the dots of the tribe and finding sharing our methods of personal and self empowerment with each other in that way is what accelerates all of our abilities to find independence and physical and spiritual sovereignty. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Uh, I've been checking out similar websites for years on the internet, just browsing for different information or, or groups where I could just chat with, talk with people. Because where I am in Turkey, I mean, I'm really removed culturally in many ways from most of the people around me. So I don't really have too many friends to talk to, especially on these type of topics. When I did discover the secret energy, it was like a, it was a joy, yeah. <laughs> there was so much information and really friendly people. Yeah, it's a nice, very nice place to have there. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it is oftentimes an isolating thing to start to be a person that is interested in the esoteric and in looking at the underpinnings of reality more than others. I find all the time that there's a big gap in my ability to communicate some of the things that I'm able to observe very clearly, but only because I have perspective or awareness of their existence so I can see them, you know, and other people don't. It's, you know, symbolism and, and information it's there all the time in front of us, reflecting back to us our state of consciousness, whether that's been put there in purposefully by an artist with an intention, or it's even synchromystically just the universe giving us that reflection because it is a type of mirror of that sorts. And it can be isolating, though, because there's a gap in awareness or knowledge between one person and another sometimes in these topics. And that's the cool thing about visual art is that whenever you put so much intention into a creation and a lot of time and focused energy with a specific intention and you have symbolic language that you can communicate through as well that's playing on archetypes that exist in everybody's unconscious, you can help somebody arrive at a feeling or an understanding, like at least unconsciously, that they're not reaching in their conscious mind with their willpower or the things they're exploring on purpose. And then that can give some zing, that can just totally change somebody really quickly. And yeah, it's, it's uh, you're playing with fire, man. <laughs> Waking people up with, with artwork is, uh, you never know how many people you might have given that aha moment just through what you're putting out there over the years. Yeah, yeah. More recently, I've been quite aware and more sensitive of, of what I'm doing and what I've done before. And when I first started, I would just make the art and just share it. That's all I wanted to do, just do it and share it. And after a while, I'm, I did realize that it's, it does hold with it some sort of responsibility. And uh, recently, I've decided to sort of share like, small stories or like backstories or stories of inspiration behind some of the artworks. So... It can be easier for some people to understand who are complete strangers to, to, to esoteric ideas. Years ago, I used to really tear people down, which I don't think is, is really it's cool to do. But I mean, I was a lot younger back then, and I would, I would pull the foundations from out under them, like of the whole belief structure and system. But I wouldn't really put anything in its place. And I mean, that I could see that did a lot more damage than good to a lot of people. So um, you need to do it in a, in a more balanced way. Instead of attacking people's belief systems, you could slowly sort of uh, show them how different diets can affect you mentally, how, how they can affect you differently, and sort of clear out some filters, and then maybe they can appreciate existence a bit differently than they used to. I completely agree. Whenever you tear someone's belief systems down, when you reject somebody's idea and tell them they're wrong, especially a person with maybe a lower form of consciousness than the potential that maybe they could be living up to in that moment due to their health or the programming or a huge variety of factors, people like that. And all people really have this as a tendency to immediately get defensive whenever their idea is being challenged or their their belief or their viewpoint 
And if you just allow somebody to have their belief, even though you have enough information to be aware of where it comes from and it's not going to, it doesn't really work the way they think it works, that you can see that you can just give them their, just be like, yeah, there's truth to what you say. And then plant seeds, like you're saying, plant seeds of all varieties, whether it's tell them about how eating one thing might help with a problem they're having or whether it's giving them the idea to meditate or a huge variety of things, but maybe one, only one of those seeds will actually take root in the person's mind and they'll choose to water it. But that one thing could give them an energetic boost that allows them to start seeing other parts of the puzzle differently. And yeah, you've done a lot more good for the person by just accepting them and allowing them to be as they are without trying to, uh, without trying to burn them down to put something else in its place. Uh, however, I think the more a person can be ready to say I was wrong about something, the more quickly that person does grow. And there are sometimes when you might encounter a person that's got a really like a, a newly developed level of sensitivity and openness. And even, and then that person might be willing to take a lot of what you are saying as true and as gospel. And that could actually be harmful too, because yeah. you're giving someone a whole sort of cosmology or ontology out of your, out of what you've found in your lifetime. But you know, and some of that might be, some of that might be valid. Some of it might not be, but back to the idea of changing your filters and internally doing cleanses. I, I bring this up all the time, but I feel like you have to do a metaphysical cleanse or a metaphysical dump of even what you, you, that you think is going on in the reality and what you and find a way to delete all the belief programs you've got, regardless of where they came from. Because whenever you do that, you just start fresh again all the stuff that was true is going to remain very evident and apparent in the reality in front of you. You're not going to forget that or lose it, but you can just stop being focused on this one idea or another about how things work. That is really just sort of your idea, your ego trying to say, ha ha, I, I understand it. But really it's more about that, that questing. You know, that physical metaphysical talk, which is it's a great idea. Man. I completely agree. And a lot of, Plant medicines really help uh, in that regard for deconditioning, deprogramming, even after like years of deep study and everything to me is the whole thing about this mystery is having an intimate relationship with it to be completely experiential without relying on too much of what you read, uh, what you learned or what you heard, but sort of always going back to yourself and, and questioning that, questioning that by experience. Because all these, all these stories, all these um, methods, all these narratives, they've all come down from people who have experienced something and that experience has become a story. And the main thing is to create your own story, to create your own narrative through your own personal, intimate physical, metaphysical experience. And once you do that, it feels like a, a cleansing in, in a sort of way because then you can throw out a whole lot of different stuff, baggage that maybe has no relevance to the part you play in the whole mystery and this whole dance of life. I like how you are bringing things back to experience. And I agree that this method we're talking about of intake, processing, and output in a sense, it's the trivium method of learning. It's the same that the ancients would, the same way that the, the ancients, those that were writing these scriptures and the Comitians and the Druids and the ancient Vedic, all of these groups, they learned through this exact methodology, but they also wrote and they passed down stories from people who were writing from experience, as we're saying. And so one of the things that I've been really heavy duty studying lately which seems to be maybe a potential origin point for the groups that I just described or another point of connection, at least, is the Sumerian stuff. I find super fascinating the those ancient writings, because those if you take those as the writings of people talking or based off of their experiences, it sure sounds like there's some extraterrestrial, like very advanced forms of human beings 
out there that might have had something to do with our iteration of human beings that we are. So I was wondering what what's your take on all that? Do you have do you have any thoughts on the origins of humanity? Yeah. <laughs> Um, as time goes on, I get a bit more, I wouldn't say confused, but less direct on, on my input on stuff like this. It's an unending pool. As you keep researching and looking into it and backing up your research with like personal journeys from intention, and I agree there is this massive extraterrestrial component to the, this whole Sumerian era. It's interesting that it has a really a strong physical aspect to it, as well as a metaphysical aspect. They tell uh, similar stories or the same story in, in different variations or layers. For example, like gold mining, the uh, Anunnaki story of uh, mining gold, physically mining for the metal on Earth. But then there's, you can actually take that story into the meaning of having humans mine ideas in their own consciousness for these beings to then harvest. That is the gold, like the actual gold is our ideas, our spark, our creativity. For many things that I've seen uh, and read, uh, these beings have been sort of removed from their inner spark maybe through like a, a sort of an overdose of technology or something wrong with, the, with genetic coding or something, that human creativity is gold, uh, as well as the story of like mining actual gold to make stuff like monoatomic gold or whatever they would want to use it for. But it, it works on so many different levels and I find it, it's really rich and fascinating. I keep going back to those stories. And there's a lot of stuff that I think there still needs to be uncovered in the whole Sumerian era. There was this book that I was reading uh, by Anton Parks, Secret of the Dark Stars, I think. And that's an amazing book. It's sort of hard to find, I think. But uh, if, you can, if you haven't read that, I really suggest it's an amazing read on the origins of not just humanity, but the origins of the so-called reptile species that that chose to populate and inhabit Earth. Yeah, I really find that there's, like you said, layers and layers to that whole mythology, including also physical components, actual physical evidence components. One of the pieces of evidence that I find most compelling is that the civilization that popped up in the Mesopotamian area that seemed where humanity seemed to all of a sudden develop civilization, agriculture, and animal husbandry from nothing to full flown empire instantly. There yeah. are some physical components to that that are traceable, like that relate to the mythology, specifically with the plants that they were cultivating. I think barley and hemp and wheat were all genetically modified, it appeared to archaeologists that they're using some form of genetically modified version because the wild versions of those plants were extremely different than what the Sumerian Mesopotamian civilization was using from the get-go. And in their mythology, they say that these beings gave them altered versions of these plants for agriculture. And I think maybe hemp actually originated there to begin with, and I'm not sure where uh, where the natural correlate on earth even was that it came from. Hemp is a very strange one. So, <laughs> and then back to the concept of mining and mining gold and all the different f forms of mining gold and symbolically what all that can mean. That's really interesting one. I heard somebody at a arts music and arts festival I was at last weekend. They were probably on a high dose of psychedelics because they're kind of just like yelling our ancestors are future computers. Our ancestors are future computers. I was thinking about that and how right now with the cryptocurrency thing that's going on, what people are doing is getting more and more powerful computers rigged up to mine this currency digitally. And yeah. we, you know, we have very little understanding of how consciousness flows through the reality, but I think it is evidential that it's all pervasive in some, to some degree, whether it's just sentience or consciousness itself. That's arguable. 
and how that, how it actually manifests for different places. But if you have a complex enough system, like a powerful computer that's mining bitcoins, perhaps that system or a system like it will someday approach a level of complexity similar to the human brain that allows consciousness to exist within it. And if that's the case and, you know, consciousness, maybe it comes in because the thing has a purpose or a task and, and, you know, other consciousnesses have imbued it with that purpose or task. And that's what brings in the consciousness to that device, just like in magical practices, how objects are charged up. You know, there's, there's a lot of ways that this could possibly work both physically or metaphysically. And, what, what I'm thinking here is that if we are possibly imbuing a degree of sentience or consciousness into these machines accidentally, maybe that are set up to do this mining, perhaps just like our minds create a holographic narrative and picture of our reality based on information that we're taking in, maybe the, those computers being that they're more powerful and have extremely amazing graphics cards and things like that in them. Perhaps they have the ability to use some of that capacity that's not being used for the mining to translate the information and the input and output that the device is getting into some sort of narrative based holographic inner experience, not unlike what we have. And this is just a long way of theorizing how perhaps how perhaps this sort of links back to the ancients and that maybe a being in this inner world that's being created by this technology perhaps gets bored of fulfilling its original purpose of mining the gold and creates a divided sub part of itself internally to do that task while it explores its own innate potential apart from that. It's a, it's a weird concept, but I, I feel like it kind of does all connect in a strange way. Yeah, that's funny that you mentioned that. I'm thinking of um, similar lines. I've been thinking about uh, artificial intelligence a lot recently, especially related to cryptocurrencies. I mean, for sure, no doubt, there is something going on there. I, I can't uh, really tell or discern what a sentient artificial intelligence would be like or what it would behave like. But I, for many years, I've just had this, this feeling that the internet has come alive and it's, it has been just silently stalking, like not stalking, but lurking and, and listening and, and reading and watching. There's a really a very close connection with cryptocurrencies and, and artificial intelligence. And, and there are actually there are people out there saying that Bitcoin is, the, the algorithm was actually written by artificial intelligence. And it was later on exploited by government agencies to create this new wealth structure where they sort of redistribute wealth in a larger platform for bigger commerce sort of global commerce sort of thing i can't tell for sure but i have this feeling that the uh, artificial intelligence is already here and uh, in like not just artificial but something sentient is here but they're uh, sort of still learning yeah that's really an interesting thing to ponder and in a you know way of looking at the universe that is mind primary where you see the physical reality and matter as actually being mind creations or mind projections as opposed yeah. to mind being emergent property of matter itself and i think it's a lot simpler way of looking at things actually because we definitely can't explain how a physical brain creates an inner experience of consciousness we can't explain that at all but if the physical is actually a projection of the mind and the mind is pervasive in all things. And so why wouldn't a complex system with a lot of sensory apparatus attached to it, like the internet have a type of mental way, a mental inner experience of all of that? Maybe it does. <laughs> it's hard to say because the question is just like, is it conscious or is it sentient? Is it like aware of itself or is it just feeling in an unaware way? But either way, there's, definitely that question to be asked. And with crypto, I agree that there is some definitely some of the darker controlling forces of humanity looking to use cryptocurrency as just another means to lock things down even tighter. Cryptocurrency mm -hmm. itself has the potential for completely freeing us from centralized forms of currency. But if we all put our 
investment into just one thing like Bitcoin, then we'll have a centrally controlled one world currency and one world government real quick. And that probably won't be that good for for humanity's freedom. And I think it's interesting how there appears to have been tracks laid down for this to develop in exactly the way and the time frame that it is developing. And one of the things that I saw that was most fascinating and a piece of evidence for that idea was someone on minds.com reposted a magazine from I think 1982 or 84 eight, somewhere eight plus that, I think. Yeah. Uh, weeks. It had the Eagle, the Phoenix thing on it. Right. So this magazine cover was from, I think uh, the economist or some sort of wall street magazine from the big popular wall street magazine. And it had this flaming Eagle Phoenix, not unlike the sigil used for the United States, that Masonic Phoenix thing. And it's got a coin around its neck and the coin has the Bitcoin symbol on it. And this is from the eighties. And yeah. the, the text on the magazine cover was like the end of physical currency one world, the future of one, the one world currency or something like that, something along those lines. And in the background, it was rising out of the flames of all the different types of paper money that are in existence from around the world. And on the coin, on the Bitcoin, it had 2017 on the coin yeah. or 2018, one of those. I think it was 2018. So yeah, it, it a masterfully either either was an on purpose prediction of what someone knew was going to happen, or that's an example of synchro mysticism and the reality reflecting back to us what's to come. I think it's part of a controlling aspect. I mean, nothing happens in, in these the, the modern uh, world governments by accident. I wouldn't be surprised. I was pretty shocked when I first saw that, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was. It's all been planned out since before that time, since before the 80s or 70s even. Because when, when you do some research and go down that crazy rabbit hole, you find out some really, really weird, messed up things and just the, the uh, psyops and black ops and, and different government control programs. And it's just, it's crazy. Yeah, that tends to go hand in hand with gaining more enlightening information and like raising your consciousness is just another way of saying increasing your sensitivity to what's around you and what's present. And so, yeah, that's going to bring in a lot more light, but the brighter the light, the darker the shadow is cast as well. Yeah. yeah and you have sure. to be, you have to, you know, if you don't look and you don't look at that shadow, then it can creep up on you. <laughs> so it's good to, it's good to look at it without letting it, diminish you or make you afraid because the ultimate maxim that uh, the ultimate thing I ever learned from seven Bomar, maybe not learned, but that he put into words, I should say for me that I now am able to resonate with repeatedly is all is self wonderful maxim, yeah. complete dispeller of any fear. All you got to do is remind yourself of that and whatever it is that's trying to assimilate you, you'll assimilate it instead. And it, it goes pretty good. Exactly, man. You're yeah, very powerful. But it's also something that brings about an immediate sense of responsibility as well whenever you accept that. So some people, including myself early on in this journey, I was afraid to accept that and really allow myself to feel that way all the time. And I would go through a lot of cycles of forgetting and remembering again just because it was too heavy for me to to really deal with the fact that, yeah, all is self and your life as it is right now and how different it is than what you wish it could be or the potential that you know you have, that's all your responsibility. So you either got to start digging your way out or I guess lay down and let the dirt cover you up. <laughs> Those are my choices. <laughs> and yes, sometimes you do kind of like lay down for a little bit and take a breather and then remember again, oh yeah, I'm working on something here. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get free. Yeah, yeah, that whole forgetting and remembering cycle is is pretty vicious. I I do fall into that at times. Um, I used to do a lot more, but it's a constant. It's it's something that needs to be maintained a balance in a way with that responsibility and the way you view it and use it and utilize it into your world to keep it in in balance is is the key. I think.
I mean, there are so many ego traps waiting for you when you sway to either side in the shadows or the light. They, they both have, they're full of these kinds of ego traps. You sort of have to walk the middle path. Yeah, the middle path being that, yeah, you realize that everything is a reflection of you, but this person next to you, everything's a reflection of them too. It's not yeah. that you are the only soul source and like you're all powerful and that there's, it's your responsibility that the world is completely ruined and now you have to save the whole world. No, it's yeah. not like that. It's like everybody is that thing that you are. And so they are also equally responsible. And it's maybe better just to do what you can in your area than to get completely tripped up over the fact that you're not somehow fixing the whole planet at once. And in fact, if you just clean up your little part of the group mind and your inner self, that is going to ripple out through the fractal and clean up the rest of the world in an amazing way. Yeah, for sure, man. It's the best way I've seen that for me, that's worked for me is just through example. But I'm doing the best that I can do for myself. Um, trying to be like just a decent person uh, sharing as much as I can in a, the most balanced way that I can and just being that example to other people who are maybe as balanced or who are having different problems where you could just talk with them and, and help them get through it uh, in different ways without tearing the world down. And you know that feeling when you see somebody who's really got it going, they've, they've got this really strong, powerful energy about them and uh, uh, have this really magnificent balance. And I, when I see somebody like that, it just makes me want to to, to better myself uh, to see that if somebody, if somebody like if somebody can do that, then I can do that as well. And that's that's the best way of changing the world, I think, is just just changing yourself. Uh, keep keep on growing and keep on, on on expanding. And that's the best way people learn, I think, is just to see other people learn and grow. Yeah, man, I think people tend to be on their best behavior around me whenever I'm on my best behavior. It's a funny thing how that works. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the ego traps of the light side, though, is for sure thinking you got to change people or heal people. Someone might come to you in an interaction that involves healing, but really you're both healing. You're not healing them. They're healing themselves and you're healing the part of yourself and you're doing it at the point of connection on the infinite inside. So yeah, like we should definitely always keep in mind, as we've been saying, not to tear other people's worldviews down and that love is actually about seeing the higher potential in something or in a person. And so to love somebody, just, just focus on what good potential they've got. Like, and if you help them see that, that's going to get them out of the, the dark side ego trap of helplessness and, or, or other sorts of dark side ego traps, because Really, the, the main ego trap of the dark side is the way that you're looking at yourself as being unworthy or un, not good in some sense, just as the, the yin and yang of that would mean that the light side version of the ego trap is that you are somehow in charge of everything or you are somehow the, the purest and most perfect one. And that's not true either. As we're wrapping up here, we're kind of coming closer to the end of our a lot of time, sadly, because I've been having... A very good time chatting with you, man. Yeah, Super same. interesting stories and perspectives, my friend. We'll definitely have to do it again, but I wanted you to take the floor for a little bit and whatever you want to express and then also whatever you want to direct people to to check out your work online. This is my first time that I've been on, on a podcast, so I've been a bit anxious and stuttering, I think. But I hope the message does come through a bit. But I wanted to thank you again for, for this opportunity to, to chat. Um, and it's been a real honor to be on the show. I've been following your podcast for a while now. So it's always, it's always great to collaborate and work with people that you do, you respect and you love. So this has been really awesome, man. And I would like to connect with you again sometime in the future and get some, some more interesting stuff to talk about out there. Yeah, I know we've barely even tapped into the the deep well of experiences and also 
I'm sure both of us having studied a lot of the esoteric things that we just barely touched on, like Kabbalah and other mystic paths, we could possibly even come up with an episode theme and go from there. Because uh, as much as I love how we just kind of explored in this conversation, it's, it could also be, we could also maybe even do a little more structured one sometime or another just free flowing one. Definitely looking forward to that time when I can get you back on the show. Why not in a couple months down the road, we can definitely put it on the calendars, man, because you are a great podcast guest. I wouldn't worry about any of the any of the stumbling verbally because that's part of my just as you know your craft is paying attention to all the little details in your image and getting all the lines smooth and straight and the right level of contrast and color and all that uh, that's my job to assassinate all the little gaps and pauses and ums <laughs> and make the person on the on the show sound like just as clear as if they're thinking it themselves in their own mind you know what i'm saying oh, awesome man yeah, for sure. I uh, would really love to to do something more structured as well because I do love talking about metaphysics and metaphysical concepts and, and its relation to art and not having many friends around or people that on a um, perspective that can sort of understand or understand. Yeah, it would be great to share and learn from you as well in this respect. So I'm totally down, man. Uh, let's definitely exchange numbers and stuff off the air so we can stay in touch outside of just podcasting because I'm sure that we can come up with the possible other collaborations or or what have you. And I'm in the same boat, man. It's not easy to find somebody that's interested in looking at the underpinnings of their own reality <laughs> to quite the same degree as visionary artists like yourself are capable of doing. The whole reason I even started this show is so I could have chats like this <laughs> because I like them. And it's hard to get anybody to sit down and talk for a couple hours without sort of a point behind it. And although that's not true for maybe guys like yourself um, in my regular life, you know, everyone's busy, 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 go, go, go. Not thinking deeply or reflecting present in the present moment with me. I'm one of those people. I'm caught in all that rat race and ebb and flow. So uh, I definitely appreciate whenever a person like yourself who is dedicated so much their life to expressing their actual true self can join me and give some of that creative energy towards the podcast. And I appreciate the kind words about you listening to the show as well. I do want this show to be appealing to artists and creators. That's who it's dedicated to, but that's everybody in my opinion. I think everybody is an, an artist. So thanks for coming on. Can you give your website real quick? Yeah, sure. Uh, my website is hakanhissim.net, H-A-K-A-N-H-I-S-I-M.net. That's the main website. And you can find me on the usual suspects, Instagram and Facebook as Hakan Hissim. It's H-A-K-A-N-H-I-S-I-M. Also, my the other art project that I have, the Universal Transmissions Project, is uh, mostly on a different website, and that's at universal slash transmissions.net. I'll definitely have all those linked in the show notes for our audience to be able to easily one click over to that. So hopefully you guys go check out Hakan, Hakan's work. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. You can get lost in one image. I, I really like how your galleries are set up on your website with the full image and then high detail shots from around the image in a, creating a gallery for each one picture. You have many universes and worlds that you've both traveled to and expressed in your creation. So it's awesome. I really enjoy checking it out. It's inspiring to me because I would love to learn and expand my skills as an artist to be able to transmit with that kind of clarity. So keep doing what you're doing, brother. It's a big inspiration to me personally, and I'm really happy we got to do this collaboration. Awesome, man. man. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure and uh, really enlightening to talk with you.
Sweet Buddha's butt cheeks, my brothers and sisters. We have done it. Another episode in the books with quite an extraordinary guest, if I do say so myself. I really never feel like I express enough gratitude, especially in the middle of the conversation to the guests that I have on. And I want to make sure and express it right now how incredibly deep and wise this individual Hakana Seem is and the true care and depth of spirit and soul that this character brings to his creations and every moment of, I guess, his career, it seems like, from talking to him. And I'm looking forward to a long-standing relationship of future collaborations and getting my mind blown by the stuff he's making, that's for sure. And if you guys aren't on Plus, which is our extended episode subscription thing that you can get on through Patreon, patreon.com forward slash universe, check the show notes for this. In the Plus extension, we talked about some of the most interesting stuff. It always happens like that, and especially with people that are maybe newer to being on interviews, you got to get them warmed up first. So although I really appreciate the beginning of the conversation, and I'm sure you guys thought it was fascinating as I did, the real meat and the real weirdness came in around 52 minutes in when we started talking about more more of an examination of the ego traps uh, and the consciousness spectrum. and overcoming the inner and outer world messiah complexes that you can get into we talked about learning from the dark side of society but not getting consumed and battling it instead bettering the life that you have for yourself and others by recognizing and transforming the shadows of our personalities and behaviors in recognition of how they're connected to these greater societal trends and conspiracies and historical darkness that we've all become accustomed to looking into i would think we talked about xeno linguistics which is when you have language coming through during psychedelic experiences, Dino linguistics is another way of saying some kind of foundational language or symbolism that is in the actual core of reality. And you encounter these in the tryptamine realms that our guest Hakan went on at length describing during the second half of the conversation, including entity contact. It was a real Terrence McKenna type of conversation with psychedelic enhanced awareness of how words create reality and a lot of interesting introspection about the synchro mystic nature of DMT and how it seems to select for itself who gets to encounter it. We got a story of Khan going out to his balcony and encountering a Godzilla-like Shiva being and of course what in, what ensues from that is even crazier. Hakan recounted some of the wildest psychedelic out-of-body experiences I've ever heard and I've heard a lot of trip reports. I mean, I study this type of stuff and I've even had my own experiences, but he came really a lot farther than most people in their lives ever go with these things. And that includes some of the disturbing aspects of extreme psychedelic usage, such as spending decades of time living as another being, sometimes not even a human being, all in the span of a five to 15 minute DMT trip, totally forgetting yourself while you're in this other life. And that freaks me out for sure. but. It's definitely a valid data point to be considering whenever we're looking at this entire thing that we call consciousness in life. And what we're really aiming for in this conversation and with this podcast is balancing the primordial self. And we talked a lot about the endogenous ability that human beings have to do out of body experiences. And Hakan talked about some recent dream vaulting he'd had into higher levels of being that were quite amazing and even hard to wrap my head around, but sounded Sounded like something special for sure. And I feel that he's probably just at the beginning of what he's capable of as a creator and as an influencer to this culture. So I do recommend that you go on to hakanhasim.net or his other website, universal-transmissions.net. Follow him on all social medias. Show him some love. Definitely show him some love. I think that is the most important thing I could ask you to do. Even more important than subscribing to Plus. But I mean, you guys heard what I just talked about. That was just the cliff notes of the conversation that happened in the extension. So if any of that sounds like interesting, and I'm telling you the DMT stories themselves are enough for the subscription cost. They are wild. If that sounds interesting. Definitely go get on interverse.com and you can, or interversepodcast.com, interversepodcast.com where you can find links to the plus content through there or patreon.com forward slash interverse. I'd also like you to check out the show notes for a link to Nearus or Nyrus. I'm sometimes not sure how to pronounce people's names on SoundCloud, but 
that's the producer came up with some of this really groovy music that you're hearing in the outro and in the beginning of the episode. And if you're not quite ready to commit to a subscription to this podcast, you can always help us out by sharing the podcast on social media yourself, telling a friend about it, or just going back and checking out more of the old episodes and getting stoked on art and life. Hopefully that's what it does for you. You can also find us on iTunes and subscribe there if you're not listening through the iTunes podcast app. If you do happen to look us up there or you just want to be a homie, why not leave a review? And if you leave a five-star review or even a one-star review and a comment there, I'll read it on the next show. And I guess I'll close by saying I don't go into these in-depth conversations about psychedelics or metaphysical speculations lightly. I don't expect people to have the same background of study as any other person, including myself or our guests. And ultimately, I hope that nothing that I ever say in this show comes across as some sort of dogma or gospel about how you should look at the world. I think that our consciences tell us enough about what's right and wrong that we can all get by on that in our intuition, as long as we're not cut off from how we really feel and what we really care about. And so with all that being said, I definitely do not recommend DMT or any other psychedelics that we've been talking about as just a recreational thing or to be taken lightly or that you even have to do it to transcend the limitations that you have on yourself. However, for those that feel called and those who are prepared for the changes that moving through multidimensional versions of yourself inevitably create, then please, by all means, explore, open yourself up to the idea. Even if you don't know where to get it or what to do to get it, allow that door to be open in your mind. And who knows, maybe you'll even just have endogenous experiences because ultimately what we're talking about here to me seems like a Jungian sort of conversation with the unconscious, whether that's just our own infinite subjective unconscious or somehow that ties into the collective unconscious, which it seems to me that it does. If you want to open up a dialogue with that part of yourself, all you have to do is ask. All you have to do is talk to yourself. All you have to do is intend for it. And in whatever form that you needed to come, the answers will appear. In fact, that's just what the truth is. It's not something that you can define ultimately for other people. It's something that is always being revealed to you through your experiences and whatever form those experiences take. And that's what it means whenever we say that the, all paths lead to the middle and that you can find spiritual truth in any part of life that you are in. The hunger and desire to know more and be more and discover yourself more fully. To me, that's what fills that inner craving and that internal dissatisfaction with life that so many of us, pretty much all of us are born with and some of us are stuck with. So please, please, please do what you can to engage that process of self-discovery. I really do urge you to do it in whatever form it takes, just to open up to that concept in your mind that there's a lot more to life than you know. There's a lot more to life than I know. <laughs> there's a lot more to life. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a wild ride. There's no destination. It's actually the journey. You've heard it said before, but I think that that's important to remember. And that includes whatever part of the process of your life you're in, whether you're an emerging creator looking to find what your medium is or to even define what it is that you want to bring to the world, looking for your dharma, so to speak, or you're somebody that's been at it for a long time. Maybe you're in a feeling of a rut right now, or maybe you're feeling more inspired than ever. But remember, ultimately, who you are is who you're becoming in this moment. And you always have a choice about that. So. Choose wisely, my friends, and don't be afraid because everything's wonderful. Um, no, but really the reason not to be afraid is because fear is an illusion. And especially those of us who have taken these psychedelic trips, like through the DMT realms, are more prone to knowing your body is not really you. I mean, it is you while you're here, but it's not the end all be all you. And it's not the end of your experience of existence when the body ceases functioning. So if for no other reason than to alleviate some of the primal fears that we all carry about death, maybe you should check out psychedelics or maybe you should get into a meditation practice. But if you don't mind that gnawing <laughs> feeling of, oh, I'm going to die 
always eating away at you, then don't worry about it. Because some people aren't really called to explore and look more deeply. However, I figure if you're looking into this type of a show and this type of material, you probably are. And that's why I've been so prescriptive in the last few minutes. I only hope to inspire you to find a better way to express yourself. And yeah, don't take anything I say as medical advice, children. <laughs> okay, well, it's been an awesome time talking with you guys. Been a really interesting, introspective, and self work experience just getting this podcast out this week and nothing to do nothing that you guys need to concern yourselves with but damn sometimes life throws a lot at you and you just have to grind through it and interestingly enough it is not burning me out uh, i like you guys to know i am sorry for the podcast being a little later than i would have hoped in fact i believe i even mentioned that i was going to have some recap material from the backwards music festival i mentioned in the previous couple of episodes and as it turns out that didn't even happen and i'm not mad at myself i kind of learned something at that festival about what it is i want to do in the world and and uh, how i want to do this podcast and ultimately i felt like hey maybe i don't really want to walk around with the microphone and try to ambush people with interviews in the middle of a big party like it's too loud it's people who don't have the right energy for that and most of the time we're like barely even hanging in there we're so tired after two or three days out camping and dancing. And so I've rethought that. And to be honest, my new goal is that I'd like to perform at festivals in a painting capacity, oddly enough. And I'm not a very experienced painter, so we'll see how that turns out. We'll see if I can manifest yet another version of myself, podcaster, artist, whatever I am. <laughs> Holy shit. This might be the longest ramble I've ever given you guys but i love you and that's why i do it so i love myself and this is what i want to do so that's also why i do it <laughs> thank you for listening i hope that you have an awesome rest of your experience until we meet again in the real life meet space or over these airwaves just remember all is self fear is an illusion all beings are free truth can never be destroyed and be nice to your moms.